uh, before we get started. And then after that, I'd like to share you what um, God has put in my heart. Dear our Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this Father's Day. Thank you for all the fathers uh, in the world. We know that we are far from perfect. That's why we are glad that we have our perfect Heavenly Father in our life. Thank you, Lord. In the next few minutes, we want to have a receptive heart. We open, you know, would you open up our heart, open up our mind, and speak to each and every one of us, Lord. Give us the wisdom. We truly believe the Holy Spirit who lives inside of each and every one of us will, have, will give us the ability to understand um, what is it that you are trying to communicate to us and what is it that we are supposed to do in our daily life with the things that we learn today. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. All of us say amen, amen. There's this one uh, guy, a pastor, a theologian, uh, an, an author uh, from the late 20th centuries in the early 1900s. His name is A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer says this, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God, what comes into your mind? And whatever comes into your mind, that is the most important thing about us. And I'll explain to you in a little bit why is it that is the most important thing in our life. When you think about God, what comes to your mind? Because that is very important. Just about a week ago, uh, me, Hansel, and a couple of other friends, we have our life group on Saturday night. We were talking. And then one of us says this, hey, I know someone who believes that God exists. But God, God exists. God is there. But he is inactive. He's just out there watching us. He's neither uh, care or, or, or interested in human businesses. He's just out there watching us. Remember, what comes into your mind when you think about God, that's the most important. For other of you, you know, for some of you, you think that he is impersonal, he is an active kind of God, right? And for other of you, he is maybe in, in your imagination, when you think of God, he's like this old man, right? A white hair, right? Um, a, a sweet old grandpa, maybe, Right, uh, 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 he's he he has wisdom, but wisdom of the old things in the past. Right, the things that he talk about is ancient. Right, he's not he's not relevant in today's world. He is far behind. Right, he's not speaking uh, to the major issues in our life in today's world. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about us. Maybe for other of you, when you think about God, you think about God that is keeping score, right? Yesterday, you did how many things wrong? You did how many sins? And you did a few things right. Today, it's a little better. You, had, you did more right than wrong, right? So he's keeping score. He, keeping close score. For other of you, when you think about God, he is an angry God. That's why you got to be careful. You don't want to make him angry, right? Now, for other of you, he is more like a, a, a genie in the bottle, right? He is more like a vending machine, a, a Santa Claus, or, or like a butler type of God. Meaning that I have a need, then I'll, you know, and when I have a problem to solve and I have a need, then I'll come to him. Can you please solve my problem? Can you, you know, fulfill my need? And then if we already uh, get what we want, we say, thank you, I'll see you later, I'll come back next time when I have another need, Right? For some of us, we think of God like that, right? Siri, Alexa, you know, I have a need. I have a problem to solve. Thank you, Siri. Thank you, Alexa. See you next time. I'll be back when I have another need. People have different pictures, different ideas when they think about God. And the reason why this is so important, I think I understand why A.W. Tozer say this is very important. Because our life will be pulled to whatever the direction that we believe about God. Because we are created on purpose for a purpose. It, it, we, there's an eternity set inside of our heart, right? So whatever that we think about God, then our life will be pulled in that direction. 
meaning so that go back to that uh, thing again. So if you believe that God is impersonal, inactive, right? He's, he's not interested in your uh, everyday life. Then we don't bother to involve him in, in our personal life, right? If we believe that he is irrelevant, Right? We believe that, you know, today's, you know, he's, um, 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 you can play that list again, Scott. It's, it's fine. It's, it's supposed to be there. We believe, the, you know, he's not, he's irrelevant. He's not interested in today's issue. Then we believe that God is not interested, you know, he, is, he doesn't know how to solve today's issue in today's world, right? He doesn't know how to handle it. He is ancient. He is old. His ways are not relevant anymore in today's life, right? Now, if we believe, that he is the type of the God that keeping the score, then we make sure we check all the checklists that need to be checked, right? Praying, reading the Bible, go to church, serve, right? You know, if I did bad, let me, let me, let me up my giving, right? I, I, I usually give a 10, 10%, but lately I've been doing a lot of bad. Let me, let me up my giving to 20%. Right? If, if, if I did a lot of bad. You know, usually I read my Bible 10 minutes. Let me up my Bible reading to 15 minutes, right? Because we know that he, he is keeping score. And if we think that he's a butler, then we treat God only when we have a need. Whatever that comes to your mind when you think about God, that's the most important thing because your life will be pulled into that direction. But one day, after Jesus finished praying, his disciple came to him. You know, Jesus, I mean, we've been praying since we were little. But when we watch you pray, Jesus, there's something different about it. Will you teach, it? Will you teach us how to pray? And this is how Jesus responded. This then how you should pray. What is that word? Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your Bible, there's Old Testament, there's New Testament, there's before Jesus, there's after Jesus. In the Old Testament, people refer God as their father only seven times. Because they didn't think God as their father. They think God as the creator, almighty one, right? But in the New Testament... They refer God as their father 150 times, more than 150 times. Jesus removed all the misconception about God that he is an angry dictator. He is far. He is inactive. He is impersonal. He's a killjoy. He's just like a cop that waiting for us to make a mistake so that he can catch us, right? He removed all of that stigma. He removed all of that misconception. And he said that God is our heavenly father. Man. Now, I do want to acknowledge this. Relating to God as he is our father in today's world is very, very tricky. Because maybe there are some of us here, we said this, hey, if God is like my dad, I don't think I want to get to know him. Right? If God is like my dad, maybe, uh, no, thank you, right? Because my dad is not around, because my dad is absent, because my dad is abusive, because my dad didn't really talk to me. The only time he talked to me is when I did something wrong and he want to get mad at me, right? When I did something right, he never come to me, he never say that he's proud of me, he loved me, right? Do I really want to know God if he is like my dad? Or maybe he's not abusive, right? I just don't have much relationship with my dad, I mean, he's just not around, right? I never get, really get to know him. I mean, he left, uh, I, I, you know, he left when I was a baby, right? I really didn't think much of God, um, much of my dad. So when you, say, when, you, you, when you tell us, like, it is so special that God is our father, I don't feel special relating to God as my father because I just don't think much about my father, Right? I understand it is very tricky nowadays. According to America First Policy Institute, 2022 data show that there are 18.3 million children live without a father in their house, in the in home, at home. 
Now, this is just in the U.S., right? This is not, I'm sure the global number is also uh, 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 staggering, right? But it's about one every four kids live without a father in their house. Whether they never have a father or maybe the father is there, but the father is just not functioning as a, function as a father. 80% of the single parents' home are led by single mothers, According to the same uh, institute, that children are healthier mentally when they have both of the parents involved in their life. When the father involved in the children's life, they tend to have a better grade in school. In the study of 56 school shooting, 56 out of that 56 shooters, school shooter, right? 46 of them grew up in unstable family and grew up without both parents. That's the type of world that we're living in today. But here's the good news. Let me tell you the good news, and I want you to believe it, that you are not part of the statistic. You might not have the fa- you, you might not have a father. Maybe your father is not around. You are not part of the statistic because God is not only our father, but he is our perfect heavenly father. The Bible says that God is the father to the fatherless, Right? He is the perfect father even if you never know your biological father. He is the perfect father even if you have a good, amazing relationship with your father and your dad is amazing and God is the perfect version of your amazing biological father. I want you to take it to heart this morning. Now, in this Father's Day, I want to take you to this parable that Jesus said, that Jesus uh, uh, teach to the people. You know, a lot of time when Jesus teach the people, when he wants to communicate this, uh, 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 the secret of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God principle, right? When he wants to show people what God is like, oftentimes he used parable, illustrations, stories, right? You know, because stories is, is easier for us to remember. We, is un- we understand better when, 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 when we are, you know, when someone tells a story and it's stuck with us uh, longer. So Jesus used this. Jesus is an amazing and a master communicator. And one, he wants to show what God is like. And he tells us a parable. And, and many of you probably familiar if you grew up in church because this is a very well-known parable. But I, I don't want you to go uh, to rush into the end of the story. Just follow along with us. And maybe there are some of us who are not familiar with the story. It's going to be in Luke 15. It's the parable of lost son. And this is what Jesus says. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. So we have a father with how many sons, guys? Two sons. Right, And the younger one says to, the, to, to his dad, you know, I know how this works, dad. You know, usually people, when they, they get an inheritance, when the parents died, right? But can we just pretend that you're dead so I can have my inheritance now, right? Even for some of you sitting here, you go like, man, if that's my kid, ooh, right? If that's my children, if that's my child, I'm not going to get away with that, Right? But somehow, some way, the story becomes very interesting because the father actually agreed to what the younger son requested. Again, we didn't know because the story is very compressed, right? We didn't know if there was an argument. We didn't know if, they, if there was a heat, uh, like uh, uh, um, the, the moment where, you know, the, the, the heated moment between them, right? But what we know is the, God, uh, the, the father granted the request of the younger son. And the story continued. A few days later... This younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. Now, if I stop the story right here, most of us probably can predict what's going to happen, right? He packed all of his belongings, he take that, that inheritance, that money, or whatever it is with him, and he moved out from his father's house. And he said that there he wasted all his money in the, and he's wilding out, you know, partying, you know, and, 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 and you... Even though you don't know the story, you know what's going to happen, right? We can kind of predict just by seeing his habit. And it's true. This is what happened. 
About the time his money ran out, a great, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. This is a perfect storm, guys. He ran out of money. He went broke. And then the famine came. He doesn't have any money now to buy food. And I'm assuming since it's a famine, it is more expensive to buy food. And he ran out of money. He can't even eat. So he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. The man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. The young man becomes so hungry that even the pots that he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. I mean, he hit rock bottom, you guys. I mean, will you know when someone hit rock bottom when even the, 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 the bowl where, where the, the pig eat from, the food in the bowl looks good to him because he doesn't have money to be he's starving. I mean, this guy hit rock bottom. And then I love this next part. It says this, when he finally came to his senses. Can you say it together with me? Came to his senses. One, two, three. Came to his senses. All of a sudden, something clicking up here. All of a sudden, something is connecting and clicking up here, right? He said to himself, at home, even the hired servant have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. Finally, he came to his senses. I was, I was listening to this one podcast, and then this pastor, uh, it's pretty interesting. This pastor says this. You know, it is very interesting. Often we love to ask this question, right? Is it, is it a sin or is it not a sin? Christians love asking this kind of question. If I do this, is it a sin? If I do that, is it a sin, right? And then this, this pastor was saying, can something just be flat out stupid? Right? Can something just be flat out, you know, just using your common sense, right? If you keep doing that, you know, this is what's going to happen. If you keep doing that, you're going to go to jail. If you keep smoking that, you're going to have lung cancer. If you keep spending like that, you're going to go broke. Can someone be, can someone just, uh, can, can something just be <laughs> common sense, right? And this guy came to his senses and he go like, wait, wait, wait. Right? Living my life outside of my father's house it's actually not all that. As a matter of fact, man, look at my life now. Because I live my, uh, you know, my life outside of my father's house. Look what happened to me. And then he started to think about all the people, all the workers that work for his dad, all the servants. He's going like, hmm, my dad's servant actually have a better life than me. I am the son. Come on. <laughs> but they have food to eat. They have place to stay. Right? This doesn't make sense. That's why it's like I come to his senses. And by this time, I guess he's smart enough, and he's like, you know what, I'm going home, but I know I cannot just show up at home like nothing happened. You know, I, I, I know that I have, to, I, have, I have to say something to my dad when I go back home, right? <laughs> and then he, he's go like, he go like, I will go home to my father, and I will say this, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as hired servant. He's like, you know what? Here's what I'm going to say. Dad, I'm sorry. I have sinned against you. You know, can you please take me back? Not even as your son because I'm not worthy. Take me back as one of your servants. Right? And he kept rehearsing that. He kept rehearsing it. This is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to say when I see my dad. This is what I'm going to say when I return home. This is what I'm going to say. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. Now, this is amazing. While the son is still way, long way off, right? The father saw him. Now, I cannot help myself but to think this way, right? How did the father saw him even when he was still far away? Maybe, I'm just thinking, maybe, just maybe, every single day, this father stand in the front porch of the house. It's just waiting for his son to come home. Maybe this is the day when he comes home. Wait, never mind. So the next day, he'll wait again. Maybe this is the day. The next day, he's waiting again. Well, maybe this is the day. And finally, one day, he saw his son. 
while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. And this is what's amazing. He ran. Now, you have to know this cultural uh, context, the cultural background. Back then, right, it is such a, 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 what do you call it? It is such a, something, it is not honorable for you to run, right? Adults don't run. Children run. Right? Not because of the physical reason, but because if, when you wear a robe, when you run, you kind of have to lift up your robe, and you have to run, and you have to, when you lift up your robe, you show your legs, and that's some, that is something that is not very honorable in their culture. Right? But the dad didn't care. His son come home. Again, I cannot help it but to think, Will I be that kind of dad? Will I have the ability to be that kind of father? I mean, come on. My son basically saying that I am dead to him. Give me my inheritance. But it doesn't matter because this father welcomed him back. With compassion, filled with love. He embraced him, he kissed him. And the son was like, okay, I'm going to say the things that I have rehearsed, right? And his son said to the father, to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. This is the thing that he has been rehearsing. And finally, he said it to his dad. And you want to know what the dad responded, how the dad responded? But his father said to his servant, to the servant, quick, bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him, get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Here you have the son talking to the father, the father completely uh, ignoring him. And he told his servant, I want you to bring the best robe, the best clothes, put the ring on his finger, put the sandal on his feet, right? Which all of those symbolize, you are my son. You are not my servant. I, you, I know you are asking to be my servant. You, I know you said that you are not worthy to be called my son, but I don't care. You are my son. And the dad says, kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. We're going to have a party and we're going to have steak tonight. We're going to have ribeye tonight. And for this, because the son of mine was dead and now he returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. They're celebrating this younger son who came home, right? Just when we thought that the movie is over, just when we thought that the story is over, Jesus take us to another part of the story. Remember this father have how many sons? Two sons. And there was the story of the younger son. What about the older son? Right? Well, here's the story about the older son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. What is with all this noise, says the older son. And he asked one of the servants, what was going on? What's with all this party and noise? And the servant says, your brother, your brother is back. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. The father came out and backed him, right? He asked the servant, what's going on with all of this noise? You know what? I'm not going to participate in the party. I'm not going in. I refuse to go in. And the servant probably approached the father. Hey, you know, your older son, he, he's not willing to come in. He doesn't want to participate. And the father probably come out, you know, talk to the older son and beg him. Come on, join us. Join us celebrating your younger brother is home now. And the older brother replied, all these years, I have, what's that word there? I have slaved for you. Never one refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friend. Yet when this son of yours, it's not, he's not even my brother anymore. He is your son, dad, right? When the son of yours come back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrating him and you even killing the fattened calf? 
by this time, if you follow the story with me uh, in, in, in Jesus' audience, by this time, everybody can kind of guess, right? You know, this, this, this father represents our perfect heavenly father, kind and loving, right? And, and the lost son probably represents some of us who are thinking like, you know what? Uh, I want to try to be outside of my father house. I want to try to live without God for a little bit. Maybe it's a, a, a more freeing, more freedom, right? Uh, you know, the lost son probably representing uh, some of us who think that li uh, living outside of father's house is better. Living outside of God is so much better, so much freedom, right? But maybe all of us who try that, one day come to our senses that, you know what, again, living without God is not all that, right? As a matter of fact, when I compare my life, actually my life was so much better when I am living with God. So the father is the picture, the picture of the, in this story, the picture of God. The lost son is the picture of some of us. Now what about the older son? Remember what we asked in the beginning of the message? What comes to your mind when you think about God, that's the most important thing. Sadly, this older son never see his father as his father. He, I think he sees his father more like a slave master, right? Because he said that I have slave for you, right? I've been working hard for you. I'll do everything that you told me to do, right? He, you know, he feels like he, this whole time he's been uh, slaving for his dad. He doesn't look at his dad as his dad, right? And his father said to him in the next verse, look, Dear son, remember, you're not my slave. You're not my servant. Look, dear son, you are my son. You have always stay by me and everything I have is yours. And the father say, wait, right? Hold up. You are my son. You are not my slave. You are not my servant. You always stay with me. And everything I have is yours. Everything I own is yours, right? Everything that I have, you have access to. But the older son didn't see it that way. Because when, when he, when, what comes to his mind when he thinks of, of his father is a slave master, right? No, my dear son, whatever I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. All the things that I own, you have access to it. And we had, the next verse says, we had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. What an amazing parable. I want to close with this. When I was preparing this message, I just do a little bit of just research. I just ask a, a most basic question. Um, what is the role of the father? I, I try to read different articles from different fields, you know, like the medic, uh, like, uh, medical uh, fields, you know, from the psychological side of it. And then, of course, from the Christian side of it, right? But as, as I read this article, everything is probably... Uh, have the same conclusion. The main role of the father in the family is as a provider and as a protector. That's, those probably everybody agree, no matter you look at it from the psychological side, from the medical side, from the Christian side of it, right? The father is the provider and the protector in the family. In other words, a father should, should, should create a safe space, a secure place, right? A place where a, the children feel safe. This is why when there's abuse in the family, physical abuse, uh, verbal abuse, emotional abuse in the family, right? A lot of fights, a lot of argument, unsta unstable household, unpredictable household. You know, the impact is very, very negative on the children, Right? Because again, they are looking for that safe place. This morning, can I say this to all of you? God is our perfect heavenly father. He is that secure place that you can run to. He is that secure place that you can run to. Then you, that you can live your life under his protection and his provision. Maybe in this room, or those of you who are listening to this in a later time, I want to speak to three different groups. The first group is this. Maybe there are some of you 
who never knew that this whole time you can actually relate to God as your perfect heavenly father. Maybe this whole time you never knew that you can actually call God your father. You never knew that he is that safe place that you can go to, that you can run to, right? In the world that is full of uncertainty, unpredictable, or even insecure, not safe. He is that secure place that you can run to, that you can turn to. Maybe you belong to that first group of people. You just never knew that you can relate to God as your heavenly father. Now, if you longing, if you desire to have that, that relationship with your heavenly father, maybe at the end of the service, Pastor Bobby can, you know, um, invite you to pray to have that relationship. The second group that I want to talk to, maybe for some of you, you can relate to the lost son. Like I said earlier, you know, maybe, you know, we, maybe we grew up in the Christian family. When we born, we born into Christian family. So we didn't know what it's like to live outside of the father's house. Right? And now we are actually curious. I want to see what life is like outside of my father's house. And maybe you decided to try, you decided to leave because you think life is better out there. I get to do whatever I want. No boundaries, no limit. I don't feel guilty, no guilt. And we also want to think there's, there's no consequences. But unfortunately, there are consequences. But here's the good news today. Your heavenly father cannot wait to welcome you back home. He is waiting for you. He wants today to be the day when you come home. Maybe for some of us, life is a mess. The mess is just too big, right? And, 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 and we actually ready to just settle for less, right? God, I want to return home, and I'm not even asking for much. Just like that lost son, you know, right? I want to go home, you know, please let me come home, right? Don't even take me back as your son, but take me back as your servant. He's settled for less, right? You are ready to settle for less. You know, God, I'm not even asking much. As long as you help me with this one problem, as long as you help me clean up this mess, I want to return home. You don't have a lot of expectation because this, it is so messy, right? But, but your heavenly father is saying to you right now, come home. My house is a safe house, a safe place for you to return. Come home, my son. Come home, my daughter. I know you are settling for less. I know you're expecting less. I know you are not asking much. But you will see what's going to happen when I restore your life. You will see what I can still do with your life, even with all the mess that you have created. You will see the blessing beyond measure. You, you will see the things that no eyes have seen, no ears have ear, right? No, the things that you never imagined, God has prepared for those who love me. Come home. Life is not better outside of the Father's house. And the last one before we close in prayer, the third group of people. This is the group of people that I call the religious duties type of people. What comes to your mind when you think about God, that's the most important. Maybe you've been a Christian for your whole life. Maybe you've been going to church your whole life. Maybe you've been striving and striving. Maybe you never have the understanding that God is your father. Or maybe, you know, because our biological father, the relationship with him is not really good. So even if we are a Christian, it's hard for us to relate to him as the father. So... As a result, we living our Christian life, you know, like it's based on works, right? We are striving, we are striving because you are trying to please God. We look at all of those things that we do, you know, as duties, as responsibilities, as a routine. This is what a Christian should do. If not, God will be disappointed at me. God will be mad at me. And this morning, you can actually take a deep breath. You can now rest in his goodness. Because now you learn he is not your slave master. 
He is not your boss. He is your heavenly father. You learn that you can relate to God as your perfect heavenly father. You know what set Christianity apart from other faith, other belief, other religion? That it is actually God who desires relationship with you. Right? That's why he wants to make sure you know you can address him, you can call him your, our father in heaven, my father in heaven. So here's what we need to do. Go home, and if you haven't already done so, put on your new identity. Or for those of you, it's a reminder, put on your identity that you are a child of God. And he is your heavenly father. What your heavenly father have is yours. Everything he has is yours. Everything he has, you have access to. You have access to his blessings. You have access to his goodness. You have access to his joy, his peace. You have access to his power. God is our perfect heavenly father. Can I invite all of us to stand up and pass above you? Would you pray for us? Amen. Amen. Let's lift up our hands. And those of you at home too, I invite you to lift up your hands and pray to our heavenly father. Lord God, we thank you for the day. We thank you that you are our good father, the perfect father, that our first identity, Lord, we are the sons and the daughters of our Heavenly Amen. Father. Amen. And then secondly, we are the sons and daughters of our fathers and mothers here on earth. Lord, teach us to always remember that. And right now, Lord God, I pray if there's anyone, Lord, who have had bad experiences with their fathers in the past, God, who doesn't have a good father figure, I pray, Lord, for healing in their Amen. hearts in, in Jesus', Jesus name. name. And in I Jesus pray, Lord God, you touch their lives, their hearts, Lord. Give a new heart, God. Jesus. Lord, and I pray, may your peace, your joy, your strength be given to us this morning. And if there's anyone here who has never made a decision to make Lord Jesus the Lord of your life, that you've never made that personal decision to allow Jesus to come into your heart, to be your Lord and Savior, to be your Heavenly Father, this morning, I'd like to invite you to receive Jesus. Open your hearts. Receive healing. Receive restorations in your life. Thank you, Jesus. If you are that person, repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, Forgive God. My sin. Be, my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. If you, I know you're my heavenly, Father, you are my heavenly Father, God. And I know, Lord, when my sins are forgiven, my sins are forgiven. Heaven, heaven is my eternal home. Is my Thank eternal you, Jesus. Home. In Jesus' name, we pray. And church, may the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord shines his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hey, God's people.